In this video, we're going to take a look at the flood fill node. So the flood fill node takes a mask as input, and it's going to take this binary mask and it's going to create data that can be used by a subset of nodes that are designed to work with the flood fill. So here, if I just do a search for flood fill, you can see that here is the node. Then we have these filters that, are, like I said, are designed to work with flood fill. So we have uh, B-box size, flood fill to gradient, flood fill to position, flood fill to random color, as well as random grayscale. So there's many uses for this node. And here I'm going to show you how to create some rock patterns. So here we're going to do this from scratch. So like I said, we want to start with a binary mask. Uh, and this is the mask that I have here. Now, there are a couple caveats that you need to know. Number one, the binary mask needs to have a border. So notice here I have these shapes that have this black border around them. This is part of the criteria that you need in your mask in order for flood fill to work correctly. All right, so now let's just uh, create a flood fill node. So we'll just create the node. Let's just group these guys, move them over this way here. And uh, let's take our mask and plug it here into the flood fill. So here you can see that uh, this is the data that we have. Now, we're not actually going to do anything with this flood fill node itself. We need to use one of the flood fill nodes to produce uh, the effect that we need. So in our case, what we're going to do, I'm going to hit the space bar here, and uh, we're going to use this flood fill to gradient. So I'm just going to left click to uh, create the node. I can take the result of the fill, and I'm just going to plug it into the flood fill to gradient. And here you can see that it produces a gradient in each one of the compartments of my binary mass that I have. And I have several parameters. So for example, I can change the angle. I can adjust my angle variation here. And then I also have this control here to multiply by bounding box size. The bounding box is determined for each shape. At a value of zero, the small shapes have a much steeper slope value than the larger shapes, since they're all using the same gradient value. So here we have this small shape, and you can see that this is going from a dark to light very quickly. If we look at this large shape, we can see it's much more of a gradual fall off. Now we can multiply by the bounding box to get the same slope value for all of these random shape sizes. So here, you'll notice that as I start to increase this bounding box size, the values are getting redistributed. So here, if I set this all the way to 1, and here I'll just zoom in a bit here in the 2D view, you can see this smaller shape. It goes from dark, and you can see, or actually here, let's look at this shape that's right next to a large shape. You can see that we have a very dark value, and then as it moves up here towards the light, you can see this lighter value is still much darker than what the brightest point here for this large shape is. So again, it's just redistributing this gradient value based on the bounding box size of each of these shapes. So for now, I'm just going to set this back to zero as we start to kind of build up this effect that we're working on. So let's come all the way back over here in our graph to where I have this flood fill gradient. So like I said, we have one of these flood fill gradients in place. So what we can do to kind of build up this rock shape, uh, and actually, just so we can really see what we're doing at this point, let's create a base material here. So we're going to create a base material, and uh, I'm just going to set this to a dielectric and give myself a, a pretty large uh, roughness value here. And then I'm going to just create a normal input, and let's create a normal node. And we'll plug in the uh, result of this gradient into here and maybe give this a value of, say, like 12 or so. And we'll plug this guy in. And then finally, just to quickly view this in my 3D view, I just do a right click and drag and drop the base material here. So here we're starting to see kind of the basic rock pattern that we're trying to create. And like I said, again, we have our angle variation that we can change here at any time. So this is a, a pretty flat result so far. So we want to start kind of building up these shape mounds. And we can do that by just uh, creating another flood fill to gradient. So let's create, create another instance of this node, plug in our flood fill. Now we're going to have two instances, and we can vary this. So what I can do here is just take the angle variation and set it to 1. And let's go back to the original node, set the angle variation here to 1. Just change the random seed for each node. So here, let's go to the second node that we have, and let's just set the random seed to 1. So here you can see the first result of this gradient, and here's the second result with just the random seed changed. And so we get a different pattern. Now, what we can do with this is blend the result of these two uh, gradients together. So I'm going to create a blend node here, and uh, then I'll just put one in the foreground, one in the background. And for the blending mode here, I'm going to set this to min. 
And so here we zoom in, we can start to see some of these 3D shapes being created. We start to get some slopes here. So now let's take the result of this blend and plug that into our normal. And we start to build up a bit of this rock shape. All right, so let's create another instance of this gradient. In this case, I'll select this node, just simply copy and paste it. I'm gonna switch the random seed value to two, create another blend. Let's take the result of the blend in the foreground, this new gradient here in the background. And again, we'll switch this to uh, min for the blending mode. And now we start to get another plane that's added here to our rocks. Let's just move these nodes here out of the way and let's feed this into our normal. And now you can see we're starting to get more shapes. Let's come over here to our normal. I'm going to set this to like maybe a value of like 35 just so we can really start to see uh, the shape of what's uh, taking place here. All right, uh, let's do this one more time. So uh, here, once again, I'm just going to copy this node. We'll bring it down. Let's switch the random seed value here to 3. And then let's create a blend. Same steps. We're just going to set, uh, we're going to blend the result here with the uh, blending mode set to min. And then we're going to uh, plug this here into our normal map. And so now, again, we start to just create another plane here. Let's take a look at uh, our actual shape that we have so far. So here's our min darken. So now we have our flood fill, and we're producing these uh, gradients with uh, a random angle variation based on the random seed. Now what we can do is we can go back to each one of these nodes and start to change this bounding box size. So here, I'm going to make sure that I'm viewing here in my 2D view the result of this final blend. And now I might go back to, let's just say, uh, this third option, and let's just start to change this bounding box size. And so as I do that, you can see that it gives me uh, the result of being able to shift these slope values. Here, let's go to a, another one. This is the second one, and we'll change this here. And now you can see the result. I'm actually able to kind of trim some of these planes here to create additional variation and help build up kind of the 3D shape of these rocks. Here we'll go to uh, this fourth node and again start to just play around with this bounding box size. So here um, just making a few adjustments. And so here you can see the kind of rock shapes that I'm starting to form just by using these flood fill gradients. Again just switching around changing here on this uh, bounding box size. Now we could also, uh, for any one of these nodes, come back over to our angle parameter and just change this to get even more variation and so on. And here you can see in my 3D view how this is starting to update. So this is just one practical way of how you can use the flood fill to create some data based on a binary mask and then take that data and extrapolate from that these gradients that can then be used to build up three-dimensional shapes. So here, just to kind of see what uh, I kind of came up with here, let's take uh, these two nodes here. I'm just going to uh, copy them, and let's see, where do I have that? I'm just going to paste these guys down into here, just so I can have them uh, kind of close to this range. Now you can see this is the result. I did the same thing here. I ran it through a, just a levels node and then did a slight slope blur on this here. So now let's output this here to my normal. And I'm going to take this base material, right click, drag and drop that into my 3D view. And so here's some of these rock shapes that I'm getting from here. Once again, I could always go back to any of my nodes and just start to play around with this bounding box size. This is almost like using like a trim dynamic brush in ZBrush where I'm just uh, changing that size and I'm just carving in and creating planes here within these 3D shapes, as you can see here. So here's a, like a plane and here's a plane and here's the rock formation that I'm starting to build uh, based on these gradients. So I had mentioned before that there are a few caveats to using the flood fill. And so number one, I said you can't have any holes. So if we take a look at this shape, now again, this is a binary mask, just black and white, and it's a circle, but we do have a hole here in the middle. And so if we use or try to use the flood fill with this type of shape, this is kind of the result that we're gonna get. So again, doesn't work with shapes that have a hole. Another example is a shape that doesn't have a black border. So here we have just this rectangle. If I hit the space bar, you can see that this just becomes a continuous shape via tiling. So if we try to take a shape like this and feed this into the flood fill, here you can see the error that is produced. Now if I wanted to fix this, I could just uh, grab this shape node and then here I'm just going to adjust uh, the X 
so that I do have this black border here. So here we'll just uh, you know increase the value 0.97 or so, and you can see here with the flood fill, now I do get the correct data. Now there's one more caveat uh, that's very important to understand here with the flood fill, and that is the flood fill requires the GPU engine. So if you're going to be using an integration such as Unity that does not support the GPU engine, you should not use the flood fill node. So here I have another example of using the flood fill node. I have a binary mask pattern, and I also have this cracks pattern here for creating a wood material. And so if I just blend these uh, two patterns together, you can see the result of, well, we do have some wood planks, but these cracks are obviously just aligning perfectly with each one of these wood planks, and this is not a very realistic result. So you can use a directional warp. So if we create a directional warp, we can offset these cracks here, this, this crack wood pattern. We can offset that on the planks based on some type of intensity input. And we can use the flood fill to help us create this intensity input based on our plank pattern. So let's do that. We're going to first create a flood fill because we need to be able to create the data from the binary mask. So I'll plug this in, and here's the data that we get. And now we're going to use a different flood fill node. So here again, I'll do a search for flood fill, and you can see that we have two options. One is the random color, and one here is the grayscale. Let's start with the grayscale. So I'll create this node, simply plug this in, and then now I have this intensity input that I can use with my directional warp. So let's plug the output of this random grayscale into the intensity input of the directional warp. And then we're going to take this cracks pattern and plug this into the input. So now we get some type of result. Uh, just so we can visualize this, I'm going to uh, place this here into the background here of my blend. And we start to get an offset. Now you'll notice that if I come back here to my directional warp, and as I start to increase my intensity, I can offset this crack pattern based on this intensity map that I've created using flood fill to random grayscale. So again, we'll go back and we'll just make a change here. Let's, let's just set this to something high like 45. And again, you can see the offset that I get. So another option of this, just to get a little bit more variation, would be to use the flood fill to random color. So let's take a look at this node. So now I'll just plug the flood fill in. It needs That's the driver. And now you can see that we start to get this random color. And this could be used in other instances as well. However, from here, what I'm going to do is just create an RGBA split node. So we'll plug this in. And now I have my red, green, blue channel. So if we look at red, I get this is the variation I have. If I look at green, I get a completely different variation. And then finally, if I look at the blue channel, I get another variation. So this is another technique for allowing me to kind of vary this intensity pattern that I could use in a multitude of ways in my graph. So for example, let's just, uh, for the intensity, let's just change this to the blue channel. And we'll go back here to our blend. And again, now we have get just a different result on our offset, depending on which kind of channel data I feed into this. So this has been a quick look at the flood fill node. Thanks a lot for watching.